Good morning, good morning, good morning. Happy Friday to you. Hallelujah. God bless you. My name is Vanita, and I am here from Unshackled from Depression. We're going to continue our lesson that we were talking about the last time we were together, and it was called, God, I'm so mad at you. We had a very interesting lesson, and I want to thank you so much for just being there. I really appreciate you. I want to let you know that God loves you with an everlasting love. I want you to do me a favor. We're going to get ready to get started, but we're going to, um, I'm going to give you a chance to go and get your Bibles and um, get settled. You can get your morning coffee. You might have, you may have a coffee mug that you, that you like and fill it with some good old coffee or um, what, uh, green tea or some mocha latte. <laughs> so we're going to just have a little time in the word um, this morning. Amen. I want you to go and get that word. We're going to pray and um, then we're going to go ahead and get started. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that this is the day that you have made and we choose to rejoice and to be glad in it. God, thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to study your word. You said for us to study to show ourselves approved, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. God, we thank you. Spirit of the living God, we give you free course to have your way this morning as we conclude this lesson in reference to how to maneuver when we find ourselves angry with you. So we thank you and praise you that you, Lord God, will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We're going to go ahead. I did promise um, to share a song with you called There is Something Something to This. You know, um, I did find that, and I'm going to still give you a chance to get your Bible <laughs> and all that stuff together, um, your your pad and your pens and things of, of that nature. But um, I, I, one thing that I've learned is that when we just can just be still in the midst of situations, that God can um, clear up the smoke, you know, and sometimes that being still or that tapping into the spirit can last for a long time. Um, I know I, I have, have had a situation that I've had to deal with for a long time. And, you know, I thought it was all over and done with. <laughs> and just recently it popped its head up again, you know. And um, so I had to, I, I, you know, I had a very interesting conversation with God. And this is it was a situation that honestly in the past I, I have been angry Um with God about it because I just couldn't understand why it was like never ending, you know? And so, um, when some things happen, I was finally able to say, God, I'm not angry with you. And, and a lot of the reason, um, centered around the teaching that I'm doing, you know, God um, teaches the preacher first. And so this teaching, when I'm, as I begin to share with you about the importance of understanding that we serve a God who is a visionary, and even though I don't know the whole crux of what he's doing in the situation that um, I'm still having to deal with, um, there is a purpose for it. And so I felt so liberated. And so I don't know, I think I, I felt like I tapped into a greater level of um, healing or like comfort. Um, as I'm going through it, you know, the scripture says that in this world, we will have tribulations. But that we can be of good cheer for God. Um, Jesus said that he has overcome the world. Amen. That means that he has the ability to dispense the precise amount of comfort that we need in order for us to get through. And not just to get through, but to grow through and to emerge through. Amen. To not only just survive, but to thrive in the things of God. So um, I remember years ago, um, I really think that it was during the time... Well, you know, I was in and out in reference to depression. So I know I was struggling with depression during the time that God gave me this song. And God would periodically drop songs um, in my heart, um, both um, lyrics and melody. And um, 
it would encourage me. And then um, sometimes I would slump right back down into depression or I would sing it for other people and it would encourage them. So this is one of the songs and I wanted to share with you. I was talking about it last time. It's called There is Something to This. And I want to encourage you that even though you may not understand the totality, the totality of what's going on, just decide that there's a God who loves you, who's taking you through this. And that on the other side, that there is a vision and a mission for your life. And that you're going to come out as pure go. Amen. And the song goes like this. There is something to this. And I cannot dismiss. Although my mind cannot conceive. There's a lesson to learn. And your will to discern. Oh Lord I fall. Upon my knees And I worship you With all of my heart Cause you know my end You know my start I worship you Jesus Christ my King Yes, I worship you with all of my heart Cause you know my end, you know my start I worship you, Jesus Christ my King you're my everything. You're my everything. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. There is something to this. There is something. There is something to this. And I want to take the opportunity to say good morning to everyone again as we continue in our lesson. Amen. Talking about God, I'm so mad at you. We talked about how many believers have been denied a time of discovery. You know, we talked about how our walk with God models um a child and a a parent and children come around a time around two or three they start asking a lot of questions and you know they want to know mommy why is this and why is that and why is the other you know and so you know we as human parents we try to you know um tell the children well this is happening because of this but this is a time that they're trying to feel around their environment they're trying to understand this world but many of us in the body of Christ have been denied because of religion we've been denied an opportunity of discovery when it comes to God you know religion will tell you that don't ask God any questions you can't approach him uh, about why something has happened or you know try to get his mind and yet the word of God says that although his thoughts are higher than our thoughts amen his ways are higher than ours that we have been given the mind of Christ so it is the will of God I'm thinking again about Jeremiah when it talks about let not the the rich man boast in his riches let not the wise man boast in his wisdom but let him who boasts boast in this that he knoweth and understandeth me. It was God speaking there. And so what is God telling us? God wants us to have an understanding. We have an intimate relationship with him. And so because we know that he is is the supreme being, we know that he has miraculous abilities. We know that he's able to, at the snap of a finger, turn a situation around. We know that he can just blow and someone can be in a, a situation where they're about to die from a terminal disease and they can be completely healed and whole. We know he has all of these this power. And so when we go to him and we pray, 
lot of us, you know, we're very disappointed when things don't come out the way that we want them to. Amen. So we talked about that um, on, on part one. And, um, you know, it's a very interesting lesson. Uh, I really, again, believe that God wants his children. Um, we're talking about how not to slip back into depression. Once you emerge from depression, there's some changes in your thinking that have to take place in order for you not to be susceptible to the enemy because the enemy is going to knock on your door again. Amen. Why? Because depression takes place in an area in us that's still open to the enemy call our soul. Amen. So he's going Gonna, if it, it, um, he takes advantage of what we don't know about God, he takes advantage of our lack of understanding. So he can say something to us about God and we'll grab hold to it because we simply have not had that conversation with God and we don't have an understanding. Amen. So I'm, I want to let you know that I'm not bashing you. want to let you know I am not rebuking you. I'm telling you, I understand. <laughs> I understand, but I also want to let you know that there comes a place in your walk with God that you need to explore. There's some questions that you have. I want you to start writing down questions that you have and that you want to ask God and that you have not gotten an answer. <laughs> and I want you to ask God those questions. And I want to let you know that God's not mad at you. Maybe you want to ask him why a certain situation happened. It can be a situation that happened to you. It can be a situation that has happened to someone that you love. It's okay to ask God questions. We talked about also the fact that we live in a fallen world. So no matter if we're saved or not, we're going to be affected by the decisions that Adam and Eve made. And, you know, that if we just stop for one minute and really just think about that. So, you know, and I want to share that you know, share about that with you. But let's just stop. So that means that. Even though I pray, even though I fast, even though I do these things. I'm still going to be touched by the corruptness of this world. And so I have to kind of prepare myself for that. That it's not a reflection that you somehow don't have faith. It's not a reflection that you're not a mature believer. It's a reflection that you live in a world that's fallen. How did the world get like that? Well, Adam and Eve chose to use the free will that God gave them to disobey God. And so as a result of that, there was an opening for the enemy to become the prince of this world. We thank God for Jesus because we were able to be reconciled to God. And we're going to talk more about that on the very last lesson, which talks about our significance, because that's another area where the enemy kind of knocks on the door to try to make us feel bad about ourselves. And it's some things we need to know. We need to renew our mind so that we can we can um, lift up a shield of faith against him when he comes like that. Amen. So we're just talking about those gray areas. So we are going to talk about today how God is not our fairy godfather. <laughs> and I want to tell you something. Let me tell you something. Okay. Um, a lot of people in the body of Christ really latched hold to this type of thinking. And it isn't your fault. And I have to say to you as a minister of the gospel that I apologize to you on behalf of ministry leaders, because we're going to talk about how that whole thought pattern came into the church. OK, so let's just start here. Right. All right. So a lot of people believe that they can manipulate God by prayers, by fasting by speaking scriptures and that that kind of shields them from having to deal with the challenges of life. We, I'm going to share um, in Job. Um, you know, Job was a, he was an upright man. The scripture says he was perfect. Now we know that the word perfect for a, a human being is if we study, it, it's, it's not the same thing as flawless. There is no flawless person. Amen. But when God says he wants us to be perfect as he is, 
He's talking about he wants us. That particular word means he wants us to be mature, to grow up. We never get to a place, even in our walk with God, that we're perfect, that we're flawless. We're always going to need God. But it said, I think this is probably a good place for me to start right there. It says that there was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright. And he feared God and he eschewed evil. He stayed away from evil. He he went to church. <laughs> you know, he did all those churchy things. And he really tried to live a godly life. Now listen. And it says that, and there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. And then he was rich. You know, his substance also was 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she asses, and very great household. And it says that so much so that he was the greatest of all the men of the East. Amen. And so it goes on to talk about how um, when the Job, um, he sanctified his children. He rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of, of children that he had. And he also, it says here, he said, in case my sons have sinned and cursed God, in their hearts, he wanted to atone for them. So he was looking out for his children. He was doing the right thing. <laughs> and so even though he did the right thing, ladies and gentlemen, he really went through some stuff. Amen. And that is when, when we start going through, he went through a multiple of things. One right after the other. And sometimes even in our lives, we feel that way. I mean, it's this, and it's that, and it's this, and it's that. You're like, ah! <laughs> you know, God, where are you? And he's like, I'm right here because I told you my word that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord shall deliver you from them all. I told you my word that, that word that in this world you shall have tribulations, but be of good cheer, for I've overcome the world. I told you in my word that a man's days are few and those are full of trouble. So we are going to have challenges. And listen, as it gets closer and closer to the return of Christ, I just have to tell you there's going to be more. But it isn't the will of God that we be consumed in the turmoil. He doesn't want us to live in fear. He wants us to have peace. It's our time to shine so that we can help other people, so that we can be wisdom to other people. Amen. But Job went through all of this stuff, you know, um, but we've gotten to a place in the body of Christ. And we're going to talk about how that where that originated. That we kind of think, and this is why some people are very angry with God, is that we kind of made him into a fairy godfather. Um, it says here in fairy tales, a fairy godmother is a mythical creature with magical powers who acts as a mentor or a parent to someone. It says here for many of us, we simply transferred our fantasies from a fairy godmother to a fairy godfather figure on to God. Because we have both heard about and experienced the instantaneous miracle working power of God that God has used. We think then that it's our passageway to justify and further cement our fantasy driven belief system. So I'm going to tell you the truth. I definitely, <laughs> I mean, I bought into the fairy godfather mindset. I really I liked it. I mean, to me, it was predictable. And um, a lot of us have presented our grocery list of expectations to God. And it says here, um, really, a lot of this came in during a movement called uh, to the Christian culture called a faith, the faith movement. During this time when the faith movement came in, people became very, um, there was a like a popping up of a lot of what they call faith centers all over the place. And they would speak, um, teaching faith, which is a good thing to be taught. Amen. But at the same time, the enemy kind of perverted the whole thing and, and there became this, um, obsession with, um, attendance. How many people do you have in your faith center? 
How many people do you have? There, there became an obsession instead of um, continuing to con- be concerned about um, discipling people one on one. There became this, you know, thought of, well, you know, it wasn't how many people were saved. It was how many people do you have in your um, congregation? And then we got to this this point and I want you to share. I want to share these things with you. Um, it was an influx of teaching about faith and its purpose and operation in the life of a believer. It swept through many churches at an astronomical rate. God needed to renew our minds in this area concerning the view that we had about ourselves. He needed, we needed to know, um, that we were a part of the royal family of God. In addition, we needed to accept the total package of being a kingdom citizen, which included embracing all that God had to offer us as children of the king. But the problem <laughs> happened when we kind of thought that we could take the scriptures and obligate God to do something. God just said in your word and which is no problem saying that as long as we're being led by the spirit and what we're saying. Of course, we speak the word back to God. But what we need to understand is that he reserves the right to still be God. So even if I declare and decree Ephesians, whatever, whatever. But right now, God has me in um, Habakkuk in my life. I'm going through a Habakkuk situation. I can decree and declare Colossians, whatever, whatever, all I want. But because God is sovereign, he's still dealing with me over here in Habakkuk. So maybe in Colossians, it's a, it's a scripture about me not having to go through trouble or coming out of trouble. But maybe in Habakkuk, it's talking about me learning how to praise God in the midst of trouble. See, what happened there with the whole faith movement is we kind of erased and, and, and er- eradicated the fact that everybody has an individual personal relationship with God and mine doesn't look like yours and yours doesn't look like mine. So you can't just cut out and put God in a box and say, well, God, you said this. And so that's why I'm going to have that right now. And that's what it, but God can prompt you can, to say these things. Amen. Of course, we want to know that we come in agreement with God. But a lot of times what happened with that particular movement is that people felt like if they said it, then God had to do it, you know. And so a lot of people became very discouraged and secretly angry with God because he didn't do what they were confessing. So you're confessing healing, you're confessing, no, I'm not going to get sick, I'm not going to get sick, I'm not, the scripture says, and then you ended up having an issue. And then you think, oh God, I don't have any faith, oh my God, you know, oh, I'm not mature enough, maybe I don't have a real connection with God. You know, God, you're making me look bad, Um, you know, some you healed somebody else of this same thing, and I, you didn't heal me of it, Um, you know, what is it, am I chopped liver, you know, what's wrong with me? This whole movement pushed us to a place that we took the scriptures and we thought we could use the scriptures to manipulate God. And that was a big mistake. You know, we said scriptures like, um, you know, um, here it is. Thou shalt also decree a thing and it shall be established unto thee and the light shall shine upon thy ways. Yes, that's so true. But if that's not what's going on in your life right now, You can decree all you want and God's still going to allow whatever he needs to allow in your life to go on. Amen. Things like um, God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Um, Hath he said and shall he not do it? Hath he spoken and shall he not make good? You know, and so, yes. (laughs) But what I'm saying is if God has, has decided that whatever trial you're going through is going to last 32 days. 32 and a half days and you get in a prayer line and say, and they say, quick fix, quick fix. They put their hands on you. They say, quick fix, quick fix. Um, Your trial is still going to last 32 and a half days. And, 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 and I just, I'm really, I'm saddened 
that we taught or that ministers taught um, people to think that they can minimize and, and kind of squish God in a little box instead of putting our attention on teaching you how to have in spite of faith or hallelujah anyhow faith. Or like when the when the Hebrew boys were in the in the um in the fire, they when they were about to go in the fire, and they had done the right thing, and they turned it up seven times hotter, they said, "Well, you know what? I know God has the ability to deliver me, but if He does or if He does not, we still are not going to bow. We should have been teaching you how to have an unconditional." devotion and an unconditional love for God instead of thinking that you could you know um, um, throw your Bible in the air and tell God what he better do or give God all these tailor you know all these specifics I want this I want that 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 instead of saying God let your will be done in this particular area see and what has happened is a lot of people because God's looking at them like Okay, you did that. I'm not doing nothing. You don't we don't obligate God to do anything. He is a sovereign king. If if God did everything that everybody wanted when they wanted it to be done, guess what? He wouldn't be God. <laughs> he would not be God. He cannot be manipulated and we taught we taught folks to try to manipulate like he's some kind of errand boy. And a lot of people are very hurt in the body of Christ right now. They're messed up. They feel ashamed. Or they feel, well, maybe I didn't do it right. You know, so, you know, it's a lot of stuff going on. And But 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 secretly, many people are very angry with God because he didn't come through. Or to them, they may, he, he made me go through a trial and not look like a fool. And, you know, and I, and I feel all of that. I understand. Believe you me. <laughs> Believe I understand all of that. But some of that is just a part of how God is. Amen. Some of that God will allow you to go through the fire and it look like you're not coming out at all. Just so he can show people that he's still God. And so we really should have been teaching you to accept God in his totality and stop, instead of trying to teach you to manipulate him. And the problem is from the pulpit was trying to manipulate God. You know, you have to be so careful. And I speak this boldly because I believe that we have erred and that we have done a disservice to many people of God because we gave you a impression about God that simply isn't true. Amen. And and we haven't pushed you to really study, to dig in that word, to see what it means. And I'm going to give you an example. Like, let's take this scripture. Because I'm going to tell you, when I heard this scripture, um, I was like, you know, hey, that sounds great. Okay. And people use this scripture all the time. All right. He said, um, um, if we delight ourselves in the Lord, that he will give us the desires of our heart. And that's in Psalm, the fourth verse of Psalms 37. Right. Delight thyself in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. Wow. That sounds wonderful. Like I could just that's just like a, a blank check. So, I'm, yeah. Hallelujah. Glory. Glory. Hey, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hey, hey, hey. Thank you. Hallelujah. Glory. Honey, I'm. How you doing, girl? I am blessed and highly favored. Honey, I just believe in the Lord. Ooh, hallelujah, glory, glory. Okay, we're doing all of that, right? And we think because we're doing that, that God has to give us what we want. <laughs> That's not what that scripture even means. Oh, my God. That was such an eye-opener for me because I went to God because I don't have a problem because I have an intimate relationship with God. I have no problem asking questions. I say to God, that's not working for me. <laughs> I'm delighting myself in you. I'm 
I'm praising you. I'm glorying in your name and you're not giving me what I want. So what is it? And so I began to dig in that scripture. And what I found out is that word delight. Now, the Bible was originally written. The Old Testament is he was in Hebrew, New Testament, Greek. So sometimes you have to go to what they call the transliteration of words. When I looked at that word delight in the Hebrew, in its original writing, it doesn't mean, yeah, it means to be soft and pliable. It means to be flexible. So when I put that back, I said, okay, so what are you saying? So the scripture in essence is admonishing us to be surrendered or tender or flexible in our relationship with God. And he will be, then, then we will be able to receive or be granted or given or infused with the will or the desire that God has for our lives. Let me give you a practical example. Let's say you are, you are, you go to church with Sister Sally, right? And so you don't necessarily like Sister Sally, but you know, she's okay. You're not tripping off. <laughs> and let's say that you get an extra $100, right? And you're just going on about your business. And um, let's say that Sister Sally, even though you don't know, Sister Sally has a need for $80. She, she, you know, some things have happened. And so she, she cries out to the Lord, Lord God, please, you know, please make a way for me, you know. And let's say the night that she's crying out to God, you're like, wow, I don't know why. I want to give Sister Sally some money. I don't even know if she needs money. The desire to give Sister Sally some money has been given to you because you live a surrendered life to God. Get it? You are surrendered. You have your del you delight. You are flexible. And he gives you the desire so you call Sister Sally, you know, you're like, wow, you know, God, I just feel, I just, you know, I just, Lord, I, my heart, I just feel like something's going on with Sister Sally. And I just want to pray for her. This might be somebody you, you wouldn't have even thought about praying for. Let's just talk. <laughs> but you have in your heart just a supernatural desire to pray for Sister Sally. You have a supernatural desire to intercede for Sister Sally. And then you call Sister Sally. And you say, Sister Sally, you know, I just want to tell you something. The Spirit is telling me to give you $80. And next thing you know, you hear her, Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, you came to thank you, thank you, thank you. Right. Because you, God gave you the desire <laughs> to give it to her. Amen. So that's really what that scripture means there. But a lot of people, you know, because there a lot of people are happy about stuff and trying to be delighted about stuff, and ain't nothing coming their way that they they said they wanted from God. <laughs> yes, guy, right. He gives you the desire. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you know what? That was such an eye opener for me because I said, oh. <laughs> Because really, you know, God's like, Benita, you know what? Y'all think I just sit around waiting for y'all to tell me what you want and just dispense it like I'm some kind of bubble gum machine. And that's what a lot of us have been led to think that we can wrap God around our finger. Oh, he's going to do this for me. I'm standing on it. You know, and you should stand on the word of God. No one's saying that you shouldn't. But what I understand is know that standing Sitting, praying, hollering, shouting, flipping, flopping, whatever you do, understand that it doesn't manipulate God or make him do anything. And if we could just accept God and his personality and accept the fact that 
He has a vision for our lives. And this world is jacked up. And he needs people who have gone through things, jacked up stuff to help other people. And then he's going to allow us to go through some things so that we can be a mouthpiece for him. Amen. So we have to understand that that means, and I was telling them on the last broadcast, which I want to encourage you to to watch, that we want to align ourselves with Jesus when it comes to blessings, but we want to distance ourselves from Jesus when it comes to suffering. (laughs) Yeah, oh, I'm an heir of God. God made a way for me. Oh, yeah, Jesus, you my boo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then when it comes time, and when I talk about suffering, I'm just talking about even just not having your way. Come on, somebody. I'm talking about dying to your will. I'm talking about... um, Loving somebody who plucks your nerve, just making a decision. I'm talking about suffering. Sometimes our, our suffering looks different way. Our suffering may be, be a part of just waiting, you know, praying to God about someone who's struggling with an issue. And the God is assigned to you and you're like, oh, I'm just sick of this. Hurry up and let it be over. Lord have mercy. And God's like, well, no, you got to do this. You know, you're like, what? <laughs> Sacrificing. So what I'm saying to you is that we have allowed people in the body of Christ to think of God in a manner that is so unhealthy for a relationship with him. And so I want to share two things with you and then I'm going to say goodbye to you. Two things God has taught me through excruciatingly painful (laughs) experiences. Is that when I come to his throne to ask for something, use a pencil with an eraser instead of a permanent marker. (laughs) You know what a pencil looks like. A pencil is a long object. I should have had one here for us. A pencil is a long object with an eraser on it. A magic marker, once you write the magic marker, there's no getting rid of it. And too many of us are going to God with a magic mark. I want this. And it's, it's so deep in us that there's no room for God to say yay, nay, or wait. We're like, I want this and I want it this time. And I want, and he might, he might not, <laughs> you know, he's God. He reserves the right to be God. But if you have a pencil and you tell God, I want this. And I, you know, this is what I would like. I'm getting, I do tell God exactly what I want. Amen. And sometimes I get exactly what I want. And sometimes I don't. Sometimes I have to sacrifice. Sometimes I end up, you know, having to go to meet a lot longer in trials than I would like to have to sacrifice. But God is a visionary. He sees beyond that. We have, we have limited Insight. We don't have the insight that God has as to what he wants to do with whatever it is we're going through. So the enemy takes advantage of that since we don't know. Right. And then religion tells us don't ask him. (laughs) Then we're like mad. Like, why did you let this happen? And I I went through something and then my other thing, let me just tell you the other thing and then I'll tell you what I went through and I'm going to, I'm going to go. The other thing that God has taught me is that. Have two lists in life, two lists, the list of I cannot control this situation, this whatever it is, or the list of I can control it. And whenever anything happens to you, you have to as quickly as you can make a determination. Can I control this? That's why, honestly, I do not complain about the weather because. For what reason? (laughs) What in the world can I do to change the weather? If God decides that it's going to be 90 degrees in January, what what am I going to do? I'm going to put some shorts on. (laughs) If God decides that, I really don't even, you know, and a lot of times in this world, we picked up one thing. People complain about the weather, if it's hot, if it's cold. All the time. I personally would rather take that energy, that 
Uh, yeah, and I place it on something that I can work on. I need to take that energy and, and start writing another book. Or I need to take that energy and um, do something that I need to do that I can control. Amen. So I have two lists. One list is what I can control. The other list is what I cannot control. And I try to determine which list, whatever it is I'm going through, goes on. If I cannot control it, then I have to say, you know, Lord, I ask you, I thank you for peace in this area. I get out all my struggle. I don't like this. It's hurting. It's painful. Whatever the case may be. And then I thank him for the peace cleansing me. And I try not to uh, let that clutter in my mind. For what? (laughs) It's nothing you can do. If I determine I can do something, oh, baby, you need to move out my way. I'm getting ready to roll up my sleeves and I'm going to let it rip. You see? So, and then there's some things I have to wait. Do I like waiting? Who does? But you, after a while, you get used to the character of God. So you don't get so mad. And then a lot of times what happens is if you wait well, you learn how to wait well. You don't just naturally know how to do that. Um, you know, you'll begin to see that you needed to have waited because if you hadn't waited, then this right here that you didn't know that was going to happen, um, needed to happen. And then you needed to meet that person and you would have never met that person if you went over there. So you needed to stay right here or you would have never been delivered of this, whatever. Or he, God wouldn't have been able to deal with, well, you know, it all will work together for good. See, that's what I have to say to, to the devil. But I had a situation like I said, recently, and I just had to say, God, I'm not mad at you that that happened. And I talked about this as we began, and I will talk about, I was really surprised (laughs) at me when I said, you know, Lord, we live in a fallen world. I don't like it. We live in a fallen world, and it's really nothing I can do about that. But I'm not mad at you because I do understand that you have the capacity to help all things work together for my good. And so, God, I choose to latch hold to that truth to help me to get through this. And there, ha- there's something in here for me. It might be, uh, you know, I talked about on yesterday um, that sometimes it's not always a lesson that God is teaching to us. Sometimes it's a, lo- a lesson that God is teaching through us. Amen. Let me help you out. There's no way I could sit here and come up with books and teachings and anything else about depression if God had not allowed me to go to it to the degree that he did. I had no idea when it was going happening that 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 was what he was doing, that he allowed that to happen. And some of you who are struggling with depression, you, you, you don't see it, but God wants to raise you up and use you as a part of the army to help. Because let me help you out. As time continues, there are going to be a lot of people who are going to be struggling with depression. And so God wants to use somebody who can authentically, yes, a scripture just came to me, who can authentically help people. Let me show you, and I'm going to get ready to close with this particular scripture. Amen. I pray, you know, that we have, um, and again, I want to encourage you to, um, first of all, go and listen to the um, the number one teaching, the first one. Um, but I want to share with you, this is a scripture that the Spirit of the Lord just gave me. I want to share this with you. And it's going to be found, yes, in 2 Corinthians 1. I love this scripture, starting with the second verse. And it says, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God, even the, listen, the Father of our Lord Jesus, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. Amen. It says, who comforts us, God comforts us in all our all of our tribulation. Listen, why? One of the reasons that we may be able, oh God, to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith 
we ourselves are comforted of God. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. God said, listen, I'm comforting you. I'm letting you go through whatever it is you need to go through. Because I'm equipping you to be able to help somebody else. There are many, many hurting people in this world. And this is just the beginning. Amen. And God wants people to be available to come and to let them know that there is still hope. There's hope. And you are hope. You. You. You need it so desperately. Why? Because you have an understanding. You know, because honestly, if you haven't gone through whatever it is the person's struggling with, most people don't even want to hear you say anything to them. <laughs> they really don't want to hear it. You know what I'm saying? So, they, and they feel that God is kind of afar off. A lot of people feel that, you know, he's kind of afar off. I don't, you know, did he go through that? He wasn't, he wasn't ever raped or he wasn't ever abused. Or he didn't, he wasn't sick or he wasn't ever depressed. So who can, who can, who can I, who's tangible that I can relate to? And that's us. We are the extension of God in this world. And so God has to allow us to go through some things. And it, and we have to go through the natural process. We need to really have a conversation with God. Say, so you know what, God, I learned a lot of things about you in Sunday school. I learned a lot of things, a lot of things about you in church. And God, I, 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 as far as I know, you know, it's true. But Lord, you said that you placed in me the spirit of all truth. I need you to lead me into truth. Denominationalism, traditions, and philosophies are interwoven in the churches that we attend. And so we need to ask God. There's so many things that I thought growing up. I, I thought that God didn't even speak to people. I was under the impression that the only, well, I thought the only person that God spoke to was um, the pastor. I thought that God was a tyrant. I thought that he had a personal vendetta against me, and I held on to that for a long time. But it made me susceptible to depression. I thought that God was unfair. He was uncaring. But what he had to let me know, no, I'm not. I love you. My love never changes for you, Benita. But there's some things I have to let you go through in order for me to use. You said you, said you gave me your life. <laughs> now I want to use it to help somebody else. And you, you're squawking. And I'm like, yeah, I am. I'm very honest with God. I never try to pretend. and You know, I have a very transparent relationship with God. And I'm not afraid of that. I'm not afraid for people to know that I know that I am nothing without him. I don't try to be strong. I just try to tap into the strength. Here's God with all that strength. Wow, and I'm going to be trying to be strong. For what? We just have such cliches. Just be strong. No, it's scripture says be strong in the Lord. God, I need you. I can't do this. The scripture says that I can do all things through Christ. I don't have it in and of myself. I don't. I need him desperately, and so do you. Amen. So it has been a pleasure talking to you. I pray <laughs> in Jesus' name that you will listen to part one and then, um, you know, really listen to this and understand that God is not our fairy godfather. He cannot be manipulated. And some of our anger toward him has to do with the fact that he just did not do what we wanted him to do when we wanted him to do it. But we have to learn that he he has this is the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And the last scripture that I want that God's just ta he is really saying some stuff to me right now. Um, the last scripture that he wants me to share is that a lot of us, you know, because I certainly did, we have it twisted. <laughs> and that is that let me find this scripture that. We were made for his his pleasure. 
He wasn't made for our pleasure. God wasn't made to cater to us. He wasn't made so that he could be an errand boy. Go give me that. Fetch me that. Fetch me that. Give me that. I want this. And let me tell you exactly how I want. No, I don't want that. No, did you hear me? Your word told me that. God's like, are y'all serious? (laughs) We got it twisted. Revelations 4 and 11 says, You are worthy, O Lord. To receive glory and honor and power. Listen to this. For you, God, have created all things. And for your pleasure. His pleasure. They are and were created. We were created to bring God pleasure. Even through the storms of life. You know why he's, the scripture says, blessed is those that mourn for their comfort. Why? Because it just means you're paying more attention to God. When you go through trials and tribulations, you pay more attention to God than you do when you're not. That's just the nature of people. Amen. But as you continue to grow and mature in your walk with God, you pay attention to him during the good times and the bad. We move out of having a conditional love for him. You know, we don't like for people, to, they call us their friends, but they have a conditional, they only want us when we, when we can give something to them and do something for them. And, you know, God's like, there should be a point in your walk with me that you just love me. That you just love me. Sometimes I think I'm there, sometimes I think I'm not. <laughs> But, you know, I do love God. And I'm learning how to just accept the fact that in this world, I will have tribulations. And they will hurt. And they will be inconvenient. (laughs) And they will sometimes linger longer than I would want them to. But I'm here to tell you, I've never been through anything God's way and come out on the bottom. I never have. If I just go ahead and allow him to be God, God has shown me that it was a purpose for it and that it worked together for my good. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I stand in the gap, Lord God, for my brothers and sisters who are struggling and who are angry with you right now, God. Father, I know that you're not upset with them because of that. Lord, on our last broadcast, you told me to tell them to give you another chance. I know that they have not understood the struggles and maybe they didn't have the perspective, Father God, that they live in a fallen world, Lord God, because of an act of disobedience by humankind. So, Father, I ask you to help your people to become acquainted with your word and to become acquainted with your ways and not be offended when you are just being who you are. Father, I ask you to help them. Help them through that process, Lord God. God, I confess that many of us as leaders in the body of Christ have misguided your people. Been so concerned about our own stuff that we have forgotten and we have turned away, Lord God, into our own philosophies instead of giving your people the pure adulterated word. God, I I confess and I stand, Lord God, on behalf being accountable for my brothers and sisters in, in the ministry, oh God. God, I ask you to touch pastors and preachers and Lord help us to speak truth to your people if they like it or not God it's it's you it's your word but one thing about it father the truth will make your people free father I thank you <clears throat> that you help us and that they will be healed and delivered and set free and that they will arise and walk in a place of spiritual maturity so that you can use them to even a greater measure than your use already. Lord, I thank you. Cover them. 
Keep them. In the name of Jesus, we give you praise. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, glory to God. I thank God for you again. Thank you, everyone who, who came and shared your presence today. God bless you. Have a great day. Amen. And until we meet again, love and kisses to you.